So to briefly introduce them, I've got Kirsty at the far end, who is one of one of the best thinkers that thinkers I have found in Norway. Kirsty's 2024, 2025 from Norway. She's a massive wool advocate. I've got Daniela. Daniela appeared at the last performance days with this product made from waste car tires. And it just won awards. They got everyone speaking. And it proves that innovation can happen within the industry. But it's innovation from a waste problem that we'd all been ignoring. I've got Kim. Those of you who don't know Kim, you have missed too much. Kim works for Sympath uh, Sympatex. They have the Sympathy Lab. The Sympathy Lab will be back in gear at the next performance days, I hope, which was when she sat down some intelligent people and they just talked subjects. So this is almost us nicking your idea, Kim because you're not running Sympathy Lab at this time. She was bringing together intelligent people looking at the bigger issues, not being diverted by the small stuff, but considering the very big issues. And finally, I have Dr. Mark Taylor, who I always fall out with. Um, we're friends, but he just knows a lot more than me. I believe all the rumors, he knows the facts. So. From this point of view, um, I'm going to start with Kirsty at the other end. When someone says to you, Kirsty, consumption, what, what immediately falls to your mind? You see the big mm. holistic question. What comes to my mind is um, pleasure and joy and fun, because that's what it is. I'm just consuming a wonderful espresso gelato. It makes me so happy. And I also got a present half an hour earlier that I'm going to consume with so much uh, pleasure. So that's one of the first things. But if you're getting more serious, of course, it's uh, consumption is, is the elephant in the room. We don't talk enough about it um, because it is what stands in the way of a lot of our sustainability issues. The industry, the textiles industry, but also any industry, we, ha we consume too much. But then again, it's a big question. Are we producing too much or are we consuming too much? Who is to blame? Is it the individual people? And we are all also consumers, even if we are producers. So who is to blame? Now, Daniela, we haven't seen you on stage before. Please introduce yourself, what you do, and what you're bringing to this panel, please. So uh, I'm Daniela. I work for Fulger. We are a polyamide spinner in Italy. Uh, polyamide is known as nylon as well. So we sell for uh, sportswear, underwear. We have plants in Italy, Serbia, and Sri Lanka, and also we are present in Asia and Turkey. Uh, we are focused on uh, sustainable solutions. I prefer saying we are focused on responsible solutions because sustainable can say can be everything and nothing at the same time. So I I like the the terminology responsible because we have to be responsible for with the the people with the planet. So we choose the raw materials for important chemical groups who are aware about how save CO2 emissions, how save uh, water usage, and um, so we are, uh, as Charles said, um, we launched this year uh, polyamide yarns that uh, offers the same performance of a standard conventional polyamide than the, that you know, uh, softer hand, uh, long luster, and, and resistance. But the raw material is obtained from uh, the oil from end of life car tires. Uh, so it's very nice uh, helping reducing the pollution of this product that we everybody needs this product and also saving CO2. So, so Daniela, when we say the, the word consumption to you, what falls to your mind? Um, to my, it's a pleasure as well as uh, my Christine said, but uh, I think uh, two, two main words. 
responsible consumption, so we have to understand, we have to question, question we have to make uh, uh, request information about what we are consuming, and also communicating. As a textile player, I try to be the most transparent possible, everything that I know I share, so I want to support all the textile chain for communicating to the brands, to the end, of, to the end users. So consumption for me is communication, uh, partnership, and we have to understand what we are consuming and helping the brands to explain to the end users. Thank you. Um, and we have Kim. Kim, please introduce yourself. Why I've asked you here. Thank you, Charles. So first of all, um, thank you for inviting me. I have more or less two roles where um, I would love to participate. Normally, I love to ask you the questions. But um, thanks for your impressive introduction. And Kirsty and me met also some years ago in the previous role I had, which was taking care for outdoor winter sport and water sport community for ISPO and for outdoors. So consumption is somehow playing the role in my life for my working life and, of course, for my private life. And now I'm with Sympatex for one and a half years now. You told me some historical, <laughs> Karina, we need, to, we need to take care <laughs> of, of all the voices afterwards. So um, being here with the word of consumption, as I said, for the private life and for the working life, it's is what we all do here. So if we have the two views on it, we need to make sure that we all know what we need to take care of. And this is in my view and thinking not only the end consumer, but also our industry. And this is what we had in the last week's congresses and meetings. Lots of the sea levels and all levels in the teams do not really know where to start if it comes to education, if it comes to communication, and where to start to make consumption more responsible. OK? <laughs> Asking me the question. Oh, I can't give him a funny answer. I was going to say consumption to me means why it hurts best friend Doc Holliday. Who, who died of tuberculosis, which we always used to call consumption. So it's a, it's a, it's a fatal disease, and uh, I think that's quite applicable, isn't it? it uh, you know, if we're not careful and we keep over-consuming and we you know, keep doing bad things. Um, what does it mean to me? I've done some work recently with some fashion brands, and what worries me is that they're trying really hard to make things more sustainable, and the cynic in me thinks that's just so they can sell more product and do the same level of damage. Um, so that's my terrible answer to your question. I want to bring in, we're now through lockdown. We're now back the other side. But lockdown did change. The whole world did change. And consumption changed. The environment changed. I would like to throw the question to you. What did we gain from being in lockdown? And what bad practice have we readopted? So, Kirsty, I'm going to start with you. What was the good thing hmm. about lockdown? And what is the bad trait that we've continued with since we've been allowed to relax? You mean the good, uh, good things related to consumption, or consume, or in general? I don't mind how you <laughs> interpret it, whether it's consumption or just the effect of lockdown, because it changed our consumption habit. Uh, looking from, from the Norwegian perspective, we spent much more time at home, which we love to do anyway. Uh, we spent time with families, we spent much more time out in nature. A lot more people actually got out in nature, uh, learning to, to sleep in a hammock, um, to do nice things, and we calmed down. And we learned to work remotely, but we've always been doing that in Norway, so it, it was for us a little bit uh, life as normal. But we consumed a lot. Uh, because all the, suddenly all the people wanting to be out in the nature, they um, also they went to buy the best, um, the best gear, the best apparel, the best garments. And we have a lot of good um, sporting goods in Norway, so there's a lot to choose from. We spent a lot of money, and now everything is filled up. The garages, the basements, everything is filled up. We continue to be out in nature, but we have a lot of stuff. So the brands were happy last year. They sold so much. It was a hoo-hoo. And now uh, they're worried because they're not buying, uh, that, no, not selling that much anymore because we have already what we need. So uh, that was the um, pandemic uh, in Norway. And maybe you refer to the, um, you want to refer to the study I talked about? Because this was a, a recently 
not a big survey. So it was about less than 1,000 people in Norway that answered to a opinion survey. Which is remember, Norway only has 5 million people, so yeah. considering. <laughs> so um, it was recently launched, like two weeks ago, and it says that uh, Norwegians are buying more sustainable, but we care less about sustainability. And how come? It, we buy less this year because everything has, the prices have gone up in general. We are more afraid. It's the energy costs, it's the war, it's everything. So we stay home and we try to spend our money, save our money, and what we have, we have to use on energy. So we buy less and we want the things to be long lasting, timeless, have a high quality, be repairable, and we buy more second hand. So that makes us more sustainable consumers, but not because we care. One other main factor also from this uh, survey that I find interesting is that it's, um, people are not very interested in labels. They find the uh, information on labels and schemes to be too complex, then it's not possible to understand. So they care very, very little about all the labels. They just want a neutral um, organization or a neutral yeah, someone, entity to take care of it for them. So if that organization is telling me I can buy from this brand and it's okay, then I can do that. I don't have the time and I don't care and don't have the knowledge to dive into that myself. And they're not sure they trust brands and industry um, they want something neutral, but then again, what is or who is neutral? So these are kind of the main findings from Norway, brought to you directly on a plane. Daniela, can you give us the view from Southern Europe, please? So going back to lockdown, what was so great and what bad practice have we returned to in your yes, opinion? It's, it's first of all, it's, it's, a, it's, ple it's pleasant uh, thinking that we, even if the pandemic was very awful for everybody because we passed through a difficult and tough moments, we can have a good, uh, good lessons that uh, how we are talking now. So this is the nice point. So I see that we are more um, aware about experiences, not just consumption not just products. So we are giving more value to be with friends, uh, to cook together, to uh, buy something that uh, feel more comfortable. So I see experience is we give the correct value because in the, before that we were, were th thinking more about consumption, consumption, and now we are aware about coming down, as she said, and feel the experience that th this is the, the very nice thing in the world. And Kim, the view from Germany, please. Oh, the view from Germany, I'm not sure if I'm able to deliver the full picture only for what this country for? here, but what I felt, and in that time when it started working for a trade show, which is a global reliance on traveling and how to communicate, um, face to face, it felt as if there are um, things getting a speed which is, is especially sustainability and taking focus for which things to talk about in terms of digitalization and how meetings happened, etc. So that felt quite um, well on one side that things which nearly really needed to be focused on took more speed totally and of course what you were saying um, for getting on travels, getting to the mountains, getting somewhere to make experience, it felt more um, responsible that you really need to make sure even with Corona or um, the transportation systems or whatever. So it felt like focusing. And the bad habit we resumed? The bad habit, um, I'm not sure if, if, if seeing the bad habit makes our industry work. So overconsumption is a mess, of course, but it felt, or it still feels in, in our region here that outdoor as an industry profited. It's the bad thing and the good thing in one. And finally, the view from England. <laughs> um, what was the good thing about lockdown? In the UK, we were only allowed to go out on our own 
without any other family members for an hour. So my two-year-old Springer Spaniel puppy, she got walked to death. <laughs> and now she expects that level of exercise every day, and she's not getting it because my 14-year-old son has decided he don't want to walk her every day anymore. So yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. I've got a lot of time staying at home with the family. My daughter just locked herself in her attic. Um, didn't see much of her. But yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, I learned that, well, I learned that our government could be really good in its, um, its approach to developing vaccines and buying them and getting them in store um, and then getting them in our arms. That was great. But I also learned that a lot of politicians, it turns out, are just crooks who uh, were sending business the way their friends and, uh, and that wasn't so great. Um, and what happened at the end of it? Well, we have a chain of, um, what would you call them? Value for money stores that don't sell online. And they didn't, they, they even stuck through that through the lockdowns, they didn't sell online. And people were queuing around the block to get in there when they opened, as soon as the lockdowns were finished. And that, I think, tells you quite a bit about this consumption idea, isn't it? That people were so desperate to get in there, to buy that, to, to fill their fashion fix. And that's not outdoor, I know it's not, but you know, garments are garments, whatever their intended end purposes. So, yeah. May we, may we hear your answer as well? Um, but I just wanted to say something about that Norwegian study. As, uh, as Kirsty knows, I, I spent an hour of my life on Tuesday translating it from Norwegian to English so I could read it properly. Uh, and there were just two images that I couldn't because they were, they were actual JPEGs. Everything else, all the graphs, luckily, were still, they could access the Excel and I could translate it all. And one thing that stood out for me was, in that study, Norwegian men are actually more sustainable than women, although women think they're more sustainable than men. I thought that was really a really odd finding. And what was the other one that they think attitudes have changed this year and now all of a sudden price is more important than sustainability, which I think that's an indication of what's to come in the next year or in the UK two years, I think we're being told, but with the impending recession. You know, the Norwegian men, they don't care how they look. It's practical and they wear their jeans and their shirts until they fall apart. I think that's mainly the reason until their wife dragged them into the store to buy something new because we would like them to. So, yes, you're totally right. <laughs> now, I want to go back to Mark. Mark's already hinted Vlad is around. Vlad is 14 now? 14. Almost 14. We're now seeing the effect of Gen Z, Generation Z. Those people born from the last years of the last millennium come in. They have different attitudes. They have different approaches. I'm a baby boomer. I'm I'm Gen X. We were the bad generation. And I'm so enthused because I'm a university lecturer. I am now seeing it postgraduate level, Gen Z. And they have a completely different set of values. And whereas I have fallen out with lots of millennials who have pointed the finger rightly at me for over-consuming, Gen Z have an attitude and they're getting on with better practice. They're not appropriating blame. And I'm really refreshed by this attitude. So I want to task the question to the panel. We are seeing the next generation come through. How are you interpreting what they're doing to consumption? I'm now seeing them living in rented accommodation. They have less storage space. So they don't want the amount of garments that I have in my loft. They have no problem with debt because they're already in very big debt. So if a jacket costs 350 euros or 550 euros, it doesn't make a difference because they're in that much debt already. But they want the garments to reflect the values that they uphold. So I'm not talking about the fast fashion generation. We all go through fast fashion. No one wants to admit to it but they are buying clothing that represents what they want to communicate about what's important. That's what I've seen from, from Gen Z. I would like to see, are you enthused by the new generation coming through? It's an interesting observation, and I can refer to my own kids who are in that generation. They spend less money on garments or uh, uh, gear for anything because they don't have it and um, they swap a lot more they buy uh, used and they uh, share they um, sell so everything is going i think the post 
uh, or the distribution companies are those who are actually taking away some of the, a lot of the, um, the income from that. Um, so it's an interesting. They have a changed attitude and are very happy to, to say that, oh, you see, my, my friend, uh, today we swapped the, the dress and going for graduation or something. It's like, oh, I desperately need to get that blue, um, blue dress from Karen so I can wear it tonight. And then she gets it back next week for her graduation. So it's, uh, that's become an, a very nice attitude. But I'm not sure if they had the money, if they could afford. <laughs> I'm lucky. I get to see them postgraduate, so they've grown out of it. But Daniela. Uh, what are you observing? You've developed a product which is ticking all their boxes. What has been their reaction to what you guys at Fulga are doing? Uh, it's, uh, I see that they don't have too much money, as you said, but not just because uh, the generation is more poor, let's say, but also because they have other, other things to spend the money that we did not have at that time. So electronics, mobile, and so on. These, those things compete with the garments. And so they, uh, the garments, they do not have a big value for them. It's prefer having a tablet or, or something like that. So, and uh, the uh, less money that they have to spend, they want to spend better, uh, understand how it was produced. Uh, so make questions. Uh, understand simply because we have to be simple to communicate to them not too much complicated and so that that's what I see they are they make many questions and they have more money uh, less money because the competition of for other things that we did not have at that time and before we go to Kim I'm keen for this to be interactive if people want to contribute if people want to suggest questions do stick up your hand and we will come to you. But Kim, I, I want to refer to one of my colleagues, I mean, who is obviously in that generation, but maybe you can ask some questions later. If, if seeing this on the various levels we have, and it's always competing with what you're saying, digitalization and all the other stuffs, but um, seeing it from the point of durability and how long we want to wear stuff. So there are so many things in mind. So my kids are 13, 16 and 17, and it depends sometimes on weeks what they think. <laughs> and on different perspectives what they do. But in a, in a complete overview, I would say um, it's on the industry, on us, to make sure that they have the transparency on what they consume and how they wear it and how long they wear it and what they wear it for. And if we have this like cliche, maybe, which is in our heads, I think we do not listen enough to what really makes the world go round. Do you invest in your where you want to live, how you want to live, as you were saying, on small flats? Or is there another solution coming up where you can save some money? And then it starts, we discussed this for various outdoor awards for Jana, which is she's outdoors awards. If you start buying a jacket, as you were saying, 350 euros, how long do you wear it? And when is style on fast fashion coming up? Because if you then refer to all the verticals, delivering jacket was a good performance, but having it way cheaper, I'm not sure where this, who, who's first? And I think industry is first on making sure that the durability and all the performance discussion is, is raised to a different level. For those of you who don't know Yana, she is behind She Outdoors, which has come from nowhere and is now the most respected outdoor product advice. And they've just come, and it's just focused on women, and they've accelerated and they've overtaken everyone else's endorsement. If you win there, it's doing tremendously. But Mark, you've got someone who's just left home for university. You still have Vlad at home. How, what are you noticing about Gen Z? I don't really talk about Vlad much. He doesn't, he only wears what his mum gives him. He doesn't have much say in that. He, he, he's not bothered. His, his favorite garments at the moment are one of his two Iron Maiden t-shirts. He's got an Iron Maiden baseball cap that we bought a gig a few years ago, um, and jeans, and that's it. And that's all he cares about. He just, he's not interested in new stuff. Part of that's because he's- Next time you have to bring some photos. <laughs> I've got some, I've got some, I'll show you. He, um, he, he's, because of me talking to him when we walk the dog, he sort of has learned to appreciate some of the issues um, in, and about greenwashing and other things in the industry. So he's really, careful about when, you know, when we go out, I said to him, shall I get you that? He said, no, no, I don't want it, Dad. No, no, he did, but he didn't want it because he didn't want to spend the money and, and have the thing. 
My daughter, on the other hand, when she was 14, she was wanting to go out every week and buy a new thing. And it was, a, it had, I mean, a bit younger than that as well. So it had to be um, a champion top or it had to be a pair of Nike trainers. That, and, that, and it's really strange. I could never quite grasp why it was like that. But that's what it had to be. And then she got to a point, I think, when she was about 16, when that changed. And a bit like I think Kirsty was saying, her and her friends share a lot. Something else that happened in lockdown was she discovered Vinted. So she buys lots and lots of vintage garments. But what I'd say is what worries me that one is, even though she's now got to university, she's still getting the garments sent to our house and, and it's like two a week. So it's like yeah, the second hand it's better, Dad, but no no you can still have too much, can't you? Um Yeah, so and she doesn't buy much new stuff anymore, it is true. She wants to spend all the money on rocks. As in stone rocks, not, not rock music. Well, that's brought us very conveniently onto the subject of the gig economy, the sharing economy, which is a trend we're seeing come through more and more. Um, and we have a question to kick it off. Someone joining in. It's Jana. First, I wanted to say thank you for the introduction. Um, couldn't have done it without so much support from uh, so many people. Um, but I, wa I wanted to, to add to the Gen Z question. Um, I had someone on my team last year, a 19 year old girl, um, and she was all about values. Um, and from, from what I learned in the interaction with her is that uh, my generation, I'm uh, 30, 34, 34, yes. Um, my generation grew up with the idea that, the illusion, I have to say honestly, that if we just put enough effort and work into something, that we can get places um, and that we can reach what our parents reached and what the generations ahead of us were able to reach through hard work and putting all the effort in. Um, and I think the main difference between my generation and generation that is that they don't have that illusion anymore. <laughs> they uh, realize that they will never ever be able to live the way that they have seen people live and generations live um, when they grew up. And that makes them question, I think, literally everything, but mostly they question whether it's worth to put their effort into things and they only put their effort into things that they really believe in, and they only put their money in things they really believe in. Um, and the most value they have and see is time, and that is the most valuable thing they have to spend, and I think that is responsible for a lot of uh, decisions they make and the way they make decisions. Would anyone else like to contribute their observations about Gen Z? You don't have to yet. But Kirsty, if we go back to that, it's the gig economy, it's the sharing side. What observations are you noticing about the way that commerce is changing? It is this rental service which is becoming popular. It is, they, I'm part of a generation where we were, if, we, if people calculate it, it was he who dies with the most toys is one. I love my daughters because they have the opposite. They just accuse me of filling the loft, of, of making Ikea rich, because I have too many storage boxes. Kirsty, what have you seen about Gen Z? Well, we see in, in and I can only speak for Norway, um, that we see that the, uh, the um, Gen Z generation are actually swapping a lot, buying secondhand. It is increasing. There are a lot of uh, new platforms coming, uh, coming out all the time. In, in offering different kind of business models, how to, how to swap and how to rent and how to buy and how to sell. And they're doing very well, they're very popular, and there's also a lot of, um, um, let's say, TV stars or famous people who are uh, fronting it and making it uh, more popular because they are who they are. Um, but on the other side, it's uh, also, it's not a very good business. I mean, it's a lot of red numbers for the companies doing it. So it's, it will still take a lot of time to get to make this a proper business also, which is very important 
to make it survive as a, um, and not to be, uh, so that we don't sit here in 10 years and say, ah, do you remember what we did in the early 20s? We started to swap clothes and rental clothes. Hm. That went away fast. So, I mean, we have to, um, um, to really realize that this is very hard work and it needs more than the younger, young people to use those platforms. We need to um, support them as well, all of us, I think. So some will go, some will stay. Daniela, what's the view for su from Southern Europe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. F for, from them, it's not uh, common yet. Uh, I live here in Europe, but I'm from Brazil. In Brazil, it's starting. We there are always behind, but uh, I believe uh, soon it will arrive also there, this behavior of buying from uh, Brechó, we say in Portuguese, from uh, second-hand stores. And uh, now it's, going, it's becoming more common here in Europe, and I believe in Brazil you will arrive very fast, also because there it's not a rich country, so we need this. Another thing that I think it would be very nice is uh, garments that could be repaired easily. So sometimes I, in our, our mothers and grandmothers, maybe they could uh, repair the garments easily. I don't, did not learn how to do it. So these things that not just buying second hands, but also learning how to repair or offer to the end user uh, garments that can, can be repaired easily or uh, shops that can repair. I think this could be also a good market to be expo uh, explored. Uh, now we don't have this. Uh, and also what I, uh, I was thinking when she mentioned uh, the generation, the new generation is they also want to uh, customize the garments. My, I have a 13 years old daughter and she wants to cut. She's not an artist. She is not creative enough, but she, in her world, she likes to cut, to drawing. So they need this uh, identify uh, the garments with themselves. So this is a creative generation and we have to incentivate this word, I think. Thank you. And Kim, they say the Germans are very boring. We would never observe anything. But what have you seen? I, I would love to extend the, the, the view on it a little because I think all the repairing and reusing is, is quite a good thing for the end of life cycle, but I think the whole solution will lie in recyclability, because the other ways are like some bits and pieces on how startups can work and how we can support that it's a longer life cycle assessment stuff, what you already had in the other panels when it comes to Hick Index, et cetera. But if it's on the real solution that will change our industry and that will really do a difference, then it's all the waste which comes to be a component for new things. And this is something where we need to encourage the generations to make sure that they wear it long enough and then buy things which have a traceability story. I think that's the most important thing. And the other things, I can only support what you were saying, but I think it's important to make the picture a little bigger, maybe. What I'm trying to highlight, you are designing for the next generation. You're that's developing product they want to use. So important. The world has changed. And my generation hasn't accepted properly the world has changed. And my generation are now leading the companies. And I think they run the risk of making their role redundant. We need to listen. We need to pay attention. They're different consumption habits. They're different ways of interacting. And this is a general message to take through. We've got to start to think about garments that we can repair, that we can share. We've got to look at a business model. There is profit within sharing garments. Consumption of garments, I'm not yet confident enough to say that it will go down, but they are, we are starting to see the traits of it going down. If you are designing the next generation of garment, these are the values that people are going to attribute to it. So you now have to consider, should I be producing the cheapest garment and selling the most? Will that actually make, will that business model become redundant? But I'm still looking around for other questions. But I have Mark. <laughs> you there, have mine. There is, 
it's really interesting this idea about repairing. Charles slags off our generation, says we're really bad. When I was at school, I was taught to sew. I was taught to repair garments. In the UK, that's not taught in schools anymore. So make things for people to repair, but they can't do it because nobody's shown them how. Um, I, I, was talk I was at a brand recently, an outdoor brand in Scotland, and they were talking to me about trying to get some of my students to make videos to show people how to repair or how to repurpose a garment at the end of its life, things like that. You know, using the sleeve of a waterproof to make a dry bag. Um, well, that was an interesting idea because like, people I know would just do that, but as I said, people just don't know how to anymore. So you don't just slag us off, Charles. We, we aren't that bad. People of our generation, because we couldn't afford things, we tend to keep things longer and be thriftier. It's, it's the ones in between, I think, that were the problem. I've never bought out in a Primark store, you know. You're so right, Mark. It's um, the importance of the skills of being able to repair something. Because we see in Norway, a lot, because we're such a digital country, a lot of startups on digital platforms. Everyone wants to make a repair service in all, all the different um, parts of the textile sector. And that's very popular, and they're getting, wow, cool, but no one knows how to actually repair the garment. So we need to start there to educate people to learn how to repair and so and so we are using the people coming into the country from other places of on the planet and they still have the knowledge they still have the competence so we, we are trying to get them up and which is a nice thing because that's also a social um, entrepreneurship uh, giving um, women from other countries uh, a place to work but it's a little bit a shame that we don't um, keep um, educating our own kids. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's great that repair services exist, commercial ones or brands that are offering that for a fee or for free. Um, but some things, they're so easy that people should be able to do it themselves. So putting a zip's difficult, maybe. Um, repairing a waterproof jacket and make it, making it stay waterproof. It, it's actually not hard to do, but you just got to know what you're doing. You know, you get some seam. You, no, 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 you get the brush on liquid one, don't you? The magnet cell rather than tape because applying tape's not easy. You need irons and stuff, but uh, there are ways to do it, but people don't necessarily know, so you send it off somewhere uh, and they can do it properly and maybe even run it through a taping machine so it would be a better repair. Um, but there's lots of things that people could do and don't, and then the garments don't get repaired because they can't be bothered to send it back with a check for 30 quid or whatever it is um, to get it repaired, and then it ends up not getting worn anymore, so then buy a new one, so we're back into consumerism, and because they're not getting them repaired. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Somebody told me recently, you, you were in Copping into this, weren't you, that um, Patagonia's repair service in the United States is the biggest repair service in the United States and services 50,000 garments a year. I just found that quite mind-blowing. I know it's a big country, but that seems like a real, a lot to me, which is great, but, sorry. <laughs> now. I want to ask a more precise question of Kim. Kim has actually transferred to the hero, the iconic product of our industry, which is the waterproof permeable jacket. But you have not gone for the one with the best figures. You've gone for the one with the best values. Can you explain more how people are taking the longer term approach to what is the most popular garment, the waterproof jacket? What is different with the Sympatex membrane? Why is it now reaching a new high? I, I need to turn and over to because when you were introducing us, I need to pass that question on because you were thinking on recyclability way m longer than Sympatex did on the same membrane. Is that more or less this, what you were saying? Can you repeat what you told me? When I was an undergraduate student in 1996, I was funding my degree by working in an outdoor store. And we sold Vaudé jackets, and they were the only jackets in the store that were, that were the first fabric was polyester. Because back then, everybody used nylon. The industry forced the change to polyester later because for various reasons that we won't go into, because nylon's actually better in some ways. Um, and I went to a lecture where by chap, the, the great Dave Brooke, who some of you may or may not know, and he was telling us all about all the different ways we can make fabrics waterproof, and he got around to Sympatex. Uh, he told us a little bit about it being a sausage skin originally and things like that. Not, but then he went on and, and basically, if you don't know, Sympatex is a hydrophilic, which is the way it moves your moisture vapor. Uh, so it makes it also monolithic, there are no holes. Polyester. And it just suddenly occurred to me that it's genius. They've made a jacket that can be recycled. And years later, I met 
Albrecht, the founder of, it's Albrecht, isn't it, of Vaude, and we were drinking whiskey together, and I said to him, well, he loves his whiskey. He said, uh, I said to him, was it an accident or was it on purpose? He said, no, no, absolutely, we knew exactly what we were doing. And just to add a little bit more, at the time they launched those garments, they launched a recycling scheme that they pulled after a few years because they were getting no garments sent back. And, and there's an obvious reason for that. Um, and in fact, I did see that a couple of years ago, they relaunched that very same recycling scheme because the jackets they were selling in the 90s were now getting to the end of their life and wanted to be recycled. But nobody buys a waterproof thinking they'll recycle it within two or three years. Do they? they shouldn't be doing They should be looking at you know, many years of life. And not that this is misinterpreted, I love talking, and I, of course, um, am what you were saying, why did I choose Sympatex as a, as a working partner for me? And this is exactly what happens in all these years in the surroundings, that this is the only recyclable solution if it comes to a membrane where the re it's being from recycled, going to recycle, so we close loop system, and I really believe in all the overconsumption, and this is why we are here for is the only solution in recycling. So this is why I'm sure that if we keep our competences together, not only from our generations, but all the generations would really take care for what they want to buy, what they want to do, what they want to think, and what they believe, that's the only solution to bring our forces together and make sure that the cycle goes round. Now, I think it's becoming, all, hopefully it's becoming obvious to the audience why I've constructed the panel. These are four individuals that I've now known for a while who have great insight and are picking up the different set of values of the people who are entering the consumption stage. Consuming stuff will change. It is changing. And I don't believe industry is reacting in time. So I'm extremely grateful to the four of you. I'm still trying to get questions from the audience, but I'm not getting questions from the audience. Because if you don't ask a question, I task them with more questions. Um, almost as a, oh. Ah, we have an online question. Ah, we've got Marion. Good afternoon, Marion. Marion's um, a big influence at Wiggle, which is a massive retailer, uh, who says, I think to make rental possible, the independent boutiques are the key. They are local, easy access, and she quotes, dry cleaners or car rentals. Approachability is key. So once again, a change of the business model. We're not making it easy. Not the pilot high, sell it cheap. They want something with presumably culture. But what do you think? So the, sh the shop I used to work in um, has a reputation in the area where I'm from, and I think even Charles knows them for this, that they've always rented ski wear to kids going on trips with school. So you, because you go in skiing once, you might never go again. What's the point in buying all that stuff? So they rent their clothing, they rent the skis, and much that David never wanted to, they rented boots. He hates renting boots because your feet swell when you're wearing them and then they become uncomfortable. So he wanted people to rent boots in resorts so they could change them if they didn't fit. But people insisted, so he, he, rent, he rents the whole thing. And Adults that are going skiing can go in and do the same. It wasn't only for kids. It's just that kids was a, a big thing for them. So this isn't new. I got married in a rented suit, and I think lots and lots of men do. And not quite as many, but plenty of ladies get married in, in, in rented dresses. Um, so it, it's been going on for years. It's just we're starting to obviously realize that maybe we need to expand it out a little bit more. Um, but there are some garments that you'll never rent, aren't there? And then there are some that I think we, we, we should and, and could. And what would you like to add, Kim? I, w I want to add something because we um, keep talking on Generation Z, so maybe I'm not sure if this is like contributing to what you were saying. Or um, I, I would love to see workshops going on, which we, which I just wrote you an email some some minutes ago on where where we can somehow maybe consider bringing all the opinions together on the generations we are talking about, because you were of course referring to our age, and somehow we are the architects of our industry, but we need to really consider how they if I may say, they <laughs> want to work, what they see, what they want to listen to, or what they want to achieve in the future. And I think one of the next platforms for the study, yes, exactly. Um, but just bring that to an end, no problem. <laughs> Keeping my microphone before you. <laughs> so um, seeing the next show, which is coming, what, which is ESPO, I would love to see some workshops going on as a sympathy lab, where we ask 
in terms of retail, in terms of eco-design, in terms of um, attitude, and on all the new business models coming up, what they want to see from us, what, need, do we, what do we need to prepare to make them in the full performance and full attitude? I just wanted to add that to the... All I wanted to say is that Kirsty's Norwegian study did an age breakdown, didn't it? I just can't remember what the differences were. It did. I'm sorry, I have trouble hearing you properly. The study you referred to earlier, the Norwegian Consumer Survey, that did break the results down by age group as well. I just can't remember what the findings were for the different age groups, but it did do it. You're Am just, I allowed to share my English language You're just version? showing um, that uh, I haven't read all the details either. Danielle, you. would you like to add anything to this conversation? No, just a just few words because I agree with you, you, say, you all said, but uh, we are the actors, uh, architectures. I like the, the expression uh, you said, but we have to understand because they are, the consumption uh, behavior is changing very fast. We have to be aware and we have to simplify the things because uh, too many complicated numbers and information and so on. Uh, we are not going to be anywhere, so just simplify is what I would like to add uh, on what you just said. It's perfect. But coming back to the elephant in the room bit of it, Charles, that's on, on your slide. Um, if we go down a, a, a rental model, that means less sales. It means making less product. Correct. But we're going to service between each consumption, yeah, yeah, so we are making less profit, but we're having a service charge going in, so the money is still in the system. We will be selling less, but taking the same amount of money. But that's where people have got to rethink and readjust though, isn't it? That Correct. requires a big change, and you've got another question from the audience. Go back to Jana. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I love the idea that you have about display and about getting into the conversation with, with the actual age groups that we are making decisions for and trying to make decisions for. Um, uh, when I look at how I myself think about the generation and how big I feel the gap um, that is between someone my age and someone 10 to 15 years younger than me, um, the, age, uh, the gap feels much bigger than going the other direction. Um, and so what now kind of pops up in my head is do we need someone to translate when you talk about simplifying Informations are we actually able to understand? Even if they tell us what they want and what they need or do we need someone or something to kind of translate that information to uh, the values and the references that we have I Think that's a good question asked can we translate? But what I wanted to do was actually reflect back to how I started this presentation. Jason Hickel has put the word out there about degrowth. You will hear more comments about it through Greta's The Climate Book. Degrowth to me is not about, there was a, there's a French shoe company and an hour after the presentation, we all sat round and they were saying that if they decreased production by 20%, they were concerned the Catherine would just uprate production by 20%. Yeah. And I feel the industry did not understand the model. The model that has changed are actually Gen Z. They want to consume differently. And I don't believe the industry is listening to it. So as a way of wrapping up, um, would you like to contribute further, further comments? I, I would love to, because I think we do not need a translator. We just need to listen properly. If there's, if, if it's, what, what we all have in expectations and education and like 40, 30 years of our industry lives, and we, we are there because other people listen to us. And if we have a different surrounding now because our world is collapsing, because our overshoot days are already in March, et cetera, et cetera, it just needs to be sure that we need to act for the lives of the different generations which are coming and also taking care that they can somehow start with different business models. And if we do not listen, I do not think we need translators. We just need to find the right formats to listen and to make these into business models, as you were saying. It's part of the intelligence of the, the company. You have to be aware about the behavior of your consumers. Uh, it's part of the, the strategy. 
and listening. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening and I'm, I'm thinking about um, consumption is not just for the generation set. I mean, it's what about us? We really need to address our consumption patterns as well. And we are probably some of the worst. So that might be for a uh, for a next panel discussion at the next event. But um, and, uh, and Generation Z is not that 100% of all of them are into these new patterns either. I mean, my daughter might be one example of swapping clothing, but then again she says, "Oh wow, I desperately need a new long black blazer when I'm now going to my master's studies in Manchester, uh, because that's what everyone is wearing." And I cannot afford other than to buy it by one of the big fast fashion companies. And it's fair. So we both need, um, because we all have the need to, to dress up, to look good, to feel good, and to, f to fit into a group. Because if you, if you are um, um, obviously standing out of your group, you are much more ready to be attacked, like the guy who um, painted a red dot on a zebra because they all look so, so alike. And this zebra with a red dot was the one that was caught by the lions. So you know, we are flock group people and we need to be belong, to feel that we belong. So there are so many uh, aspects to take care of in this discussion. And I want to uh, really discuss our consumption and the general overproduction at another time. I think our consumption rate is predictable with age and less usage. But Mark, what would you like to add to this? Anything? Otherwise, I'm taking the question. No, not a lot, to be honest. <laughs> Am I? Yeah. Uh, just a, uh, a note to the rental thing. Uh, uh, it is that if if we have to produce things to, that have to be rented, then w the quality have to be much better. So the resources that we now use to make two t-shirts will go into one t-shirt that can be rented. So I don't think we should be that panicking about that it will be absolutely a cut down on what we produce. We just have to produce things with more care. You're right that you'd have to Im improve the quality to make them last, but it won't be one to two, will it? It'll be one to ten. You'll you'll um, you'll take ten t-shirts out of circulation because that one rented one will do. So in actual fact, consumption of materials will go down. Um, but they will have to be more durable. But there are advantages to this rental system because if you know you can get those garments back, it makes it easier to recycle them because you can take them to the recycler and say, I promise you, these are 100% polyester, even the zips. You don't have to worry about it. I am promising that to you. Whereas if the garments have been bought by customers and then they end up in uh, a sorting center somewhere in the UK, probably Oxfam in Batley or something, and they sort them, they can't know that, especially without a digital passport or anything. So those garments won't get recycled because nobody knows what the zip was made from. So there are advantages beyond just the reduction in consumption. Now, I want to pull this panel to a close. Kirsty, would you like to add anything that we should be f further considering? Well, I, don't, I think I just said it. We need to uh, discuss our, our own, or not, uh, or the consumption and overproduction in general. And I find it very interesting to, to look at the perspectives from both sides. Is it uh, on the consumer's responsibility? to consume less, or is it on the producer's responsibility to pro put less on the market that is tempting to the consumers? So who is actually having the responsibility to reduce? Daniela? Summarizing my thoughts, I would say uh, the consumption must be responsible. Uh, responsible today, uh, not thinking about what can I do in the future. L let's be responsible at least today and tomorrow again and tomorrow. So we have to be responsible and r thinking and uh, what about what we are consumption. And also about the next generations, we have to be aware uh, about what they are, the movement, the behavior changing, uh, plan and act imme immediately. So we have to be uh, fast reacting to, to be in the line. Fully agree. 
Fully agree, and adding to this that in my role and in the industry where Sympatex is one of the solution parts, I think it's, um, I need to take that position that we are in the responsibility to shape how many products we serve, how long they are in the markets and what we do if it's over with that product. And this is, for me, the most important thing to discuss in the future. Was, oh, I was going to say something I've said a few times in the last couple of days. Um, it, it, we've been advising some fashion brands on trying to be more sustainable. And, and one of the things I always say to them is the easiest way to have your environmental impact is to make half as much product. And they all know that's the truth, but that's, what, that's one thing that nobody's prepared to do. So, you know, the, 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 they will keep making it as long as people keep buying it. And it's a chicken egg thing, isn't it? We, uh, and Charles already touched on it. If, if one brand decides to make less, another brand will just fill that gap. Um, and until everybody agrees and everybody reduces, which in the sports world might happen, I just think it's different to the fashion world. Um, but if, if only one person says, no, no, I'm not going to do that, then it, w it might not make a difference. So we, it, it's, we need to somehow persuade the consumers to consume less, and that will then hopefully drive the brands to make less, but I don't know how you do that. The one insight I'm going to give, which I haven't revealed with the panel is you guys know I'm meant to be at a good design school. The single biggest channel that we have this year is degrowth. Because we have been advised by the great trend predictors, this is the incoming. And I believe that's why the European summit had this as the theme. The following week we had Blue Earth Summit, which was very much the same. But Blue Earth Summit, for those people who don't know, it's the second time they've run it. They ran it in Bristol in England. And it was a consumer event. And it was the first consumer event I went to where the questions being asked were at a higher cranial level than at the European Summit. And that is showing the emphasis to me. What I hope, this has not been an easy panel, but we have explored some subjects. I think in two years' time, what we have started on the dialogue, the degrowth, you will reflect back on and say, yeah, it's normal. In two years' time, it is going to be part of this industry, which is why I'm appealing now to the design team. You need to start thinking about it. And on that note, can I ask you to show your appreciation for these four characters with a slightly different point of view? Thank you so much, and that concludes Performance Day's presentation stage. Um, we're over until March 15th, 16th, but we have Astrid. We've taken over Astrid's whole conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to us, um, Sustain and Innovate Conference. Uh, we will be back in winter and um, the performance days uh, will take place on the 15th and 16th of March, um, but not here at the MOT in Munich. It's will, it will be back in the Messe Munich. And if you've uh, missed a panel or a discussion, feel free to go um, on the website. There is everything in 10 days. So you can check everything. So thank you so much and see you hopefully um, next year. Goodbye.